The Anglo-Saxons are famous for a lot of reasons, making beautiful manuscripts, laying the foundation of the modern English language, but also for their martial prowess, with figures like Alfred the Great and Edward the Elder, and of course Athelstan being famous heroes. The Anglo-Saxon period would come to an end at the Battle of Hastings, when the Normans defeated the English army and took over the country. For the Normans, the cavalry, the horse, was very important for their military strategy. So much so that when Tolkien was writing his adventures in Middle-earth, he created a whole basically Anglo-Saxon civilization called Rohan, but changed a key element to feature it entirely around the horse and cavalry. But that leads to the question, did the Anglo-Saxons actually use horses for warfare, and if so, in what way? Let's first take a look at some Old English words for cavalry and horses. Now, the ancestor of the modern English word horse is the Old English horse. It's related to a Frisian word horse, which is still used, and the Dutch word ros. Some dialects potentially still say horse as well. There's also another word in Old English, which is eo, which we'll come across again, and also meach. And this word is actually the ancestor of the modern English word mare. There's also, of course, the two famous Anglo-Saxon heroes, Hengist and Horsa. Horsa is, of course, related to the modern English word horse, whilst the word Hengist is actually related to an Old English word Hengest, which meant stallion and is actually still used in Dutch, a related word, and some Scandinavian languages here as Hengst. So really, the Hengist and Horsa were essentially the Anglo-Saxon My Little Pony twins. Now, British horses were fairly small before the Romans arrived, but when the Romans got here, they actually used Germanic troops of cavalry and introduced new breeds of horse, like Frisians, which ended up creating a stockier type of horse in Britain during the Anglo-Saxon period. Now, we hear about horses already from Bede, who was writing in the early 8th century and wrote about how young men love to race on horseback, especially nobles. During the time of Athelstan, we even get some laws relating to horses, banning their sale abroad, for instance, in certain circumstances. Now, hunting was an incredibly important pastime for the nobility, and it's likely that horses were being used in this capacity. Which leads me on to today's sponsor, called Hunting Clash. Hunting Clash is a free game available on iOS and Android. Become a hunter and lay in wait for your prey in several different locations, from the mountains of Montana through to the deserts of Namibia and elsewhere. Use a selection of weaponry to hunt various animals across the world, ranging from deer to bear and through to more exotic animals as well. The great thing about playing this game is it's a fun way to spend your time and you'll see yourself increase in your abilities as time goes on. There's usually several animals around, so sometimes it's best to sit tight and wait for the best shot to come up. Use my gift code HUNTWITHHILBERT to get a special reward which is available for new players. You'll get 100 gold, 70 skills tokens to upgrade your preferred skill and get more points when hunting, one mythical lure from grizzly bear in Montana, one mythical lure from mountain lion in Montana, both of these help you hunt bigger animals, and this is all for a total value of $15. To redeem your gift code, follow these three simple steps which are up on the screen, and this is available for new players. Check out Hunting Clash today. Horses were clearly important status symbols in the Anglo-Saxon period. For example, in the poem Beowulf, there are several stanzas that describe them. This one, for instance, says, Heachta eor la chleo eachta meras, fated chleore on flet teon, in under eodaras, thara anum stod sarl serum fach, sinche ye wurthad, that was Hilde settel heach cuninges, dona swerda ye lach, sunu halfdenas efnan wolde which translates, that's line 1035 to 1041, then the Lord of Warriors commanded eight horses, golden cheek, to be led to the floor, inside within the precincts. On one of them stood a saddle decorated with artistries, worthied with treasures. That was the battle seat of the High King, when the son of Halfdan would engage in sword play. But as you'll notice, it recommends the horses and it describes them, but it doesn't actually mention that the sword play is happening on horseback. There is also a famous Old English maxim from the Maxims, which reads, Eor shall on eos boge, eorod shall ye trume ridan, faste feda stondan which is the Maxim 62 to 63, and translates to an earl belongs on the back of a horse, a troop must ride in company, a foot soldier stands fast. Now this can be interpreted in a number of ways, and the traditional historiography of Anglo-Saxon cavalry is that there wasn't one. 
This can be backed up by several sources. For example, the very beginning lines of the Battle of Molden, despite the fact that we've lost the true beginning lines, read, Het tha hisa chwene, horse for letan, feor afizan and forth gangan, hejan to handum, and to hi egodum. Which translates to, and then Burknoth ordered each of his warriors to release their horses, to hurry them far away and to go forwards, mindful of their hands and their stout courage. Now this is interesting because it does suggest that there were horses around. In fact, the horses are explicitly named. But it also says that the soldiers dismount to fight. And actually the second message that wouldn't be lost on an Anglo-Saxon audience is the fact that he's urging them to tell them to go far away because this essentially is him saying, we are not going to be fleeing today we're going to be fighting and so we're going to put the horses which would help us to escape faster completely away because we're brave men. Now this is actually juxtaposed later in the poem because we find out that Godrich Fram Guther and Vona Gordon forlet the him many and oft mer ye sailor. He ye chleop vona eoch the achte his chlafod on them ye redum the het richt ne was. And you can probably tell from the tone of my voice that this isn't good what's happening. Godrich, who is one of the men sworn to protect his lord, went from the battle and abandoned the good one, who had often given him many a horse. He leapt upon the horse that his lord owned into the trappings, although it was not just. So essentially he is now fleeing away on one of these horses that was given to him by his lord Burchnoth, who has just died in the poem. So again, we know that there are horses around, but clearly the fact he has to get on the horse to escape means they're not actually fighting on the horses, but they're using them for transportation. And for a long time, this has been the main idea behind the use of horses by Anglo-Saxon armies is that they were used for transport but not for fighting on. This seems to be backed up by a later account in the Chronicon ex Chronicis which documents an event that took place in 1055 when a Norman earl in England, of course this is before the Norman conquest so he is serving the Anglo-Saxon king Edward at the time, he basically orders his Anglo-Saxon men, the Fjord, to mount up and fight on horseback alongside his Norman retainers against the Welsh. And he describes this as contra morem in equis pugnare usit, which it basically means contrary to their custom. So Florence of Worcester here is highlighting the fact that the Anglo-Saxons are not accustomed uh, to fighting on horseback. What is interesting though is that the Normans are actually the first ones who run away from the battle and the Anglo-Saxons continue to fight against the Welsh on horseback. But is this conventional view that the Anglo-Saxons didn't employ cavalry the whole story? Well, no it isn't, because actually there is some evidence to suggest that they did actually fight on horseback. For one, we have the Abilemno stone, which, although datings vary, is probably from the mid-9th century, although it shows events that took place in 685, a battle between the Picts, who also ended up making the Abilemno stone, and the Northumbrian Anglo-Saxons, and as you can see, they show both sides on horseback, which does indeed suggest that if this is an accurate portrayal of that battle, then there would be Northumbrians on horseback. And actually something that may lend some credibility to it is the fact that we can see that the Picts are using the Pictish square shields, which is accurate to what the Picts were using, and that the Northumbrians are instead using the round shield that we know the Anglo-Saxons used. So possibly that points to it being correct. We also have evidence within the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Now, in the year 871, of course, the great heathen army was attacking Wessex, and there are several lines in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that describes Anglo-Saxon groups, West Saxon groups, specifically going out and attacking Viking raiding and foraging parties on horseback. And we get various terms. The Old English Yehorsedan is used to describe these, basically ones on horses. So we know that these reconnaissance groups and raiding groups that the West Saxons were sending out were on horseback. And this is a particularly interesting term, the Old English Radehere, because the Rade is related to the modern English word ride. So again, we're thinking people on horseback. But Particularly interesting is this second element, here, because this is the old word for army, 
and indeed it is used for armies in other contexts on its own, and this would suggest indeed some kind of mounted troop if we are combining ride and army together. So that again is very interesting from an etymological point of view. In Athelweird's Chronicon, which was written almost a century later, we also have described in 893 the Battle of Buttington, where the young Prince Edward the Elder is described also as having chased the Danish army on horseback to a nearby fortification. Now, whether this was a pitched battle or more of a pursuit that was done on horseback without actually any fighting going on isn't entirely clear, but it can be interpreted in various ways as well. What is interesting, though, is that Athelweird uses the, he's writing in Latin, and he uses the Latin term equestri, which of course is related to the word for horse, and is most likely cognate with cavalry. So, again, if this is anything to go by, and if his information is accurate, then it does seem that there is some kind of cavalry being employed, certainly warriors on horseback once again. Perhaps then it's prescient to reanalyze how we read the maxim and focus a little on this first phrase that an earl belongs on the back of a horse because perhaps we're not talking about a special division that is a cavalry division but rather about the fact that the nobles, the eldermen and their retainers might have been on horseback and may also have been expected to pursue a fallen enemy as they did at Buttington rather than some kind of headlong charge as we would expect knights to be doing later on. Indeed, this does seem to be backed up by some evidence in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, where we later on read that there is indeed in this whole list of different figures that are very important, we also get a horse thane. Edgewolf was apparently King Alfred's thane of the horses in 896. And he clearly seems to have been an important figure, and he may have been responsible for indeed breeding private horses for the king, perhaps for hunting or for the king's own person, or perhaps to be distributed among the eldermen so that they indeed could be shown for war. Now, in the Battle of Brunanburh, some have pointed, this is a poem about the battle of the same name, some scholars have pointed to there being real evidence for a described cavalry charge by the West Saxons. The passage in question, which is from 29b to 33a, reads as follows. West Saxa forth, on long ne day, eo red schistum, on last leg dun, lavum theodum. Heowan her fleman hindan theerle mecum milen sherpen, which really revolves around this word eorod chistum. Now the whole passage together means something like the West Saxons went forth all that day, and in either troops or cavalry they pursued the enemy. They hewed the hated foe from behind with blades sharp from the grindstone. The debate basically stems around this part of the compound, eorod. Now, eorod is actually itself a compound. The eo, as we discussed earlier, was one of the Old English words for horse. Now, rod actually comes from rad. It's changed over time. And this word meant both something along the lines of riding, expedition, and road, as in a path that can be travelled along. Now, Eorod, as put together, probably originally meant something like horsemen or a group of horsemen, and indeed we come across Eorod in various contexts like this. The problem is that over time the meaning of Eorod has shifted somewhat. For example, if we look at the writings of a certain Alfred who was writing in the mid 10th century, then he often glosses the word Eorod with the Latin term legio. And we, of course, know that legio is Latin for the legion, and that's specifically in the context in which he's writing about eorod and glossing it with legion, the Latin word, that he isn't talking about cavalry at all, but rather about foot soldiers or footmen. And there is also a problem with the entire compound of eorod chistum as it comes in Brunanburh as it's found that in only one out of four instances, there are only four times when we come across this word in the entire Old English corpus, in only one out of four of these is it explicitly about horsemen. And in fact, in the other contexts, it's not explicitly about horsemen at all, but rather a group of people. And in fact, we have some evidence suggesting that it's not talking about cavalry at all at the time it's being used. This is from the Alen poem, where we read, Four fyrda mast, fedan trimedon, eo red chestum, 
that on Alflice deareth lacende on Danubie, star ked furethe, stather wicked on umbthas wateres wilm, which translates to the greatest of armies advanced, the foot soldiers fell into formation, into troops. This is the word eored chestum being used to refer to the foot soldiers. So that in a foreign nation on the shore of the Danube, the resolute spear warriors camped beside the surge of the water. So in, clearly in this context, it's not talking about cavalry, so it need not specifically be about cavalry. And instead, in a really good article, which I'll link below, written by Paul Saville, he in fact states that it should really be translated more like en masse. And so the reference to it in the Battle of Brunanburh, rather than talking about elite West Saxon cavalry as it's sometimes been translated, is in fact talking more about the horde, juxtaposing the West Saxons and the Mercians on foot with the Scots who had beforehand been described as being on horseback and mowing down the innocent farmers of the country. So while this doesn't necessarily mean that it's not on about cavalry specifically, it's not exactly positive evidence that outright states that the West Saxons are fighting on horseback as it has sometimes been presented in the past. Now for the rest of this video, I'd like to address a few of the uh, arguments put forward by Anne Highland. And I will actually link in the description another really good article uh, that talks about this and some of her ideas as well as a couple of others. She supplies evidence that that basically says there's a lot of emphasis on horses being provided for wartime by noblemen uh, as well as obviously weapons and armor and helmets and that kind of thing and asks well why would they be put in conjunction with one another she also points to the fact that the Normans didn't actually change their heriot system uh, where the ruling classes had war horses that had to be accompanied by a saddle, by a mail coat, helmet and weapons after they had taken over. And so surely if they were levying the same kinds of horses and weaponry, then they must have been suited to fighting on horseback. She also points to the fact that in 1064, there is a passage where Earl Harold of Wessex, who would later become Harold II, is in Normandy. He is with the Normans and he and some of his retainers go on campaign with the Normans against the Britons. And the Normans, of course, were a famous cavalry people and so they must have been on horseback. And she argues that he wouldn't have been fighting alongside them if he hadn't also been fighting on horseback. And that by extension then the Anglo-Saxons must have known how to fight on horseback and so must have done it as well. Now this is certainly possible but I'm a little bit skeptical about this. For one, the majority of time spent on campaign is actually on the move. Getting from your own territory to the territory of the enemy, then finding the enemy and doing battle with them either out in the open or besieging forts, which is actually a lot of what happened during the Breton campaign of 1064 to 1065. And we already know because of all the references to Anglo-Saxons riding and even noblemen supplying them and leaving them behind at the battle that Anglo-Saxons riding horses isn't in question. The question is whether they fought on them. And it doesn't actually preclude the fact that they were simply riding along with the their Norman hosts and then dismounting to fight as was their style. Um, that That's po quite possible. And actually a lot of the time uh, during the, the Breton campaign, it was besieging the, the force that the Bretons were ensconced within. Now, they could, yes, have also fought on horseback alongside the Normans, but... I'm not quite as convinced, and in fact there is a story that they actually rescued some Norman knights who had got bogged down in quicksand, uh, and while this doesn't preclude that, they obviously rode up to the quicksand then got off their horse and took them out. Potentially, it's the fact that the English were actually on foot, and so that they didn't get bogged down in the ground and were therefore able to help the Norman knights who got trapped there. And actually, as we can see on the Bayeux Tapestry, there is a scene from the Breton-Norman campaign being described, and we can see Norman soldiers there with flaming torches, not on horseback. Uh, they are fighting on foot as well, so we, we know that there was fighting happening on foot, uh, and the English were probably getting involved in that. So I, I don't think the evidence that there were Englishmen involved in this campaign is direct evidence for Anglo-Saxon cavalry. I think that link is a bit tenuous, particularly given the circumstance of the campaign and the fact that nowhere it actually mentions that the Anglo-Saxons, including Harold, were fighting on horseback 
or indeed that all the Normans were fighting on horseback all the time either, especially given the uh, constant uh, chasing of the the, uh, British or the Breton Duke from town to town, the sieges that were occurring doesn't really suit to horseback style fighting. Now let's turn to 1066 because there are a few points made there and one is about the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Now this battle was fought between Harold Godwinson and an invading army of his brother Tosti and Harold Hardradi who was the Norwegian king at the time. Now there are various accounts of the battle and indeed uh, Anna Highland refers to the one in Heimskringla, how it's described there. Something to note about Heimskringla is that it was written several centuries after the battle was fought, and so we have to be a little bit skeptical about some of the details that are in the battle. In any case, this is what it says. It says that, then said King Harold, what is your advice? Earl Tosti answered, the first thing to do is to turn back as quickly as possible to our ships for our men and our armor, and then after offer such battle as we can. But another plan would be to take to our ships, and then the cavalry cannot overcome us. The king said, we shall do something else. Put our fastest horses under three bold fellows. Let them ride as fast as they can and tell the Norwegians of the danger. They will come straight away to help us. The English must sooner expect more fight from us than flight, and we shall fight bitterly at good time before we acknowledge we are beaten. Now this does imply indeed that there is cavalry that is coming to attack them, uh, and that the Norwegians had cavalry as well. Perhaps this is a little bit harder to believe, seeing as they had just crossed the North Sea from Norway, so that's already a little bit of a red flag, but not entirely impossible. However, just as this later image of the battle shows, This really is more of an imagining of someone more from the 13th century rather than from the 11th century. It reflects more the kind of warfare that was occurring in the 13th century with cavalry charges. It later goes on to describe archers as well. Not only that, it also sounds a lot more like the Norman style of attack rather than the Norwegian style of the mid-11th century. With massed cavalry charges and reins of arrows, that sounds an awful lot like Hastings. And we actually know that Heimskringla conflates Hastings and the Battle of Stamford Bridge because in Heimskringla we also read about the fact that Harald Hadradi apparently is killed because he gets an arrow to the throat. Now, similar body part, king dying on a battle in 1066, cavalry charges, archery charges, it sounds quite familiar, so I'm not sure how much we should be trusting Heimskringla as a completely uh, a reliable source for when it comes to the fact that there were cavalry charges, especially based on this amount of evidence there. Highland does point to the fact that there have been finds of Anglo-Saxon stirrups in the area, absolutely, but the fact that there are stirrups doesn't necessarily mean that they were fighting on horseback. There's also the fact that in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which was written contemporaneously, there is no mention of horses being deployed by the Anglo-Saxons in the fight against them, and especially the fact that one of the most famous stories to come from the Battle of Stamford Bridge is, well, it was fought on a bridge. And so the fact is that horses aren't great for charging across a bridge, especially an Anglo-Saxon wooden construction as it would have been. And whether it's true or not, the fact that the main story to come out of the Battle of Stamford Bridge is of a giant Norwegian holding off the Anglo-Saxons on the bridge uh, so that the Norwegians can prepare. Now, again, it doesn't sound like cavalry is involved at this point, nor that they would be the most suitable for that task. So I think we once again have to be skeptical about using this as as evidence for Anglo-Saxon cavalry being deployed. She also draws several inferences from the Battle of Hastings, one being that the fact that Harold chose a hill, Senlac Hill, uh, to oppose the Normans meant that he knew how to fight on horseback because he knew that a hill location is a good location to counter cavalry and the only way to know that is to himself be able to fight on horseback. Um, With no disrespect to Highland, I think this is a poor argument, simply because having a hill advantage is a good advantage whether you're fighting against footmen or against horsemen. Uh, And I don't think that necessarily he would have to himself be an experienced cavalry fighter to know that having the hill would grant him the advantage against a foe. And in fact, that was a common battlefield tactic at the time, that a defending force would indeed take a hill uh, upon which to to fight against the enemy, nor the fact that they could employ anti-cavalry strategy. As we've said, the 
the Welsh employed cavalry and he'd fought against the Welsh. Uh, the Scots are also known to have used cavalry in a more limited way. And indeed, he had fought with the Normans. So, well, he was probably expecting the Normans to come on horseback. And he fought against the Bretons with the Normans. The Bretons also being quite experienced cavalrymen at the time. So I don't think that drawing the inference that he must have been an experienced cavalry fighter himself is necessarily going to stand to reason there. There is a final bit of evidence as well from 1081, which is at the Battle of Dirachium, which is a battle being fought by the Byzantines and by the Varangian Guard. Now, the Varangian Guard are, of course, famous for being sort of Vikings, let's say, uh, lots of Norsemen joining them. But following the conquest of England by the Normans, actually lots of Anglo-Saxons who were discontent with Norman rule or who had lost their lands actually went over and joined the Varangian Guard to the point where it became known as the anglo varangian Varangian Guard, no, or even English settlements in Crimea, uh, so maybe Crimea should be British again, who knows. But um, yes, yeah, to the point where there were a lot of Anglo-Saxons in the Varangian Guard. But to bring that right back, this Battle of Dirachium, uh, we get a description of these Varangian Guardsmen from England riding to the battle and then again dismounting before they fight and then fighting on foot. Uh, so again, it seems like that is the most common way that horses are used by armies in the literature appears to be the fact that they would ride to the battlefield. So they certainly knew how to ride and were riding and had horses, then would dismount to fight and fight on foot. And then potentially, if needed, pursue a defeated enemy on horseback or indeed to get to the battle or cut them off like we saw in Alfred's Wars of the 870s that you would have these horsed troops that would go up maybe Eorod being the right word, would pursue an enemy on horseback but fight on foot. So if this is the case, then why didn't the Anglo-Saxons develop a cavalry? I mean, the Rohirrim are so cool. Why couldn't they just do that? I think there's probably a few reasons, and one lies at the heart of the Anglo-Saxon military organization, which centered around the Fjord. These were essentially the local lads that would be called up when trouble was brewing. If there was a Viking raid in the area, it would be the peasants from the fields who would be called up into armed service. They would rotate after a while. It was one of Alfred's innovations uh, that changed the feared system. But the majority of the Anglo-Saxon or the later English fighting force was made up of non-professional fighters who were part-time fighters and would be called up when time was needed. Now, there were also, of course, the nobles and their retainers, probably a few hundred uh, at most, maybe a few thousand uh, for the king. Uh, but these wouldn't be numbering in a great amount. They would be professional fighters and properly kitted out, and most likely the ones, as the maxim says, who would be on horseback. Earls belong on horseback while the footman stands fast. The thing is that the majority of the force were these peasant laborers, the freemen. And so for, to be kitting them out with horses would take an awful lot. They certainly didn't have horses themselves. And so I think also in terms of the cohesion and organization of such a force, it was a lot easier to train them to fight on foot, uh, especially in a short amount of time, rather than to mess around and get them on horses and create a kind of cavalry force. Now, you could say, okay, that's fair enough, that, but then why wouldn't the feared be, let's say, the ground forces and these uh, more noblemen with a bit more money and horses, why wouldn't they form a cavalry? I think this is partially to do with the Germanic warrior culture that the Anglo-Saxons had. Because in the poetry, we read an awful lot about how the Earl should comport himself in battle, how he needs to be brave and lead from the front, and how in turn, as we saw in the Battle of Malden, for example, his men are accepted to then fall around him and to fight until the death and to avenge him. So I think the, the real thrust of the argument is that the Fjord weren't the great fighters of the Anglo-Saxon army, but they were the majority. And I think if you had the noblemen and their retainers on horses going off somewhere else, they couldn't be inspiring, giving hope to the Fjord that were around them that were armed probably with meat hooks and spears and things like that and really didn't want to be there. So I think it's partially to do with the culture, the warrior culture, of course, thinking Beowulf and these heroes, and partially in terms of the morale of the men, as well as there not being a very strong cavalry tradition among them already. Finally as well, the Anglo-Saxon shield, the round shield, is not very suited to fighting on horseback. 
The reason for this is that the round shield is actually designed to be used in combination with other shields to make the shield wall formation because then it's not only your shield that protects you but also the next man along. And this is, while not easy, it's fairly manageable to teach this to a large number of people within a short amount of time. Cavalry fighting, on the other hand, is a lot more difficult to teach to a lot of people. The problem with a round shield on horseback, however, as opposed to simply standing, is that your legs are incredibly exposed when on a horse. Your legs, of course, will be at the height of a man's arms when you're on horseback, and that means they're weapons. Contrast this with the Norman kite shield, which can be, when wielded in the right way, also protects the man's lower half when on a horse. You can see why the Normans used a kite shield and the Anglo-Saxons used the round shield. The kite shield is designed for fighting on horseback. Of course, it can also be used on foot, but the main reason for its shape is to protect the man's legs on horseback. So I think partially also in the design of the shields, we can see a preference for not fighting uh, as cavalry. Now, later on, and actually you'll see this on the Bayer tapestry, uh, the Anglo-Saxons did take over the, the kite shield of the Normans, starting in the 1040s already during the uh, quite, well, I wouldn't say quite pro-Norman reign of Edward, but he certainly had some Norman innovations that came in then. So potentially in Hastings, we are seeing some kind of shift to a more Norman style of fighting. But for the majority of the Anglo-Saxon period, the round shield simply isn't very suited to fighting on horseback. Uh, and, and I think that's a final nice little way to end this video. So, Anglo-Saxon cavalry, yay, nay, maybe. Um, I think more towards the nay side of having uh, a kind of uh, mounted division like the Normans or maybe charging headlong, we don't hear about that anywhere in the sources. And in fact, any, uh, any sort of mention of an Anglo-Saxon fighting on horseback has to be inferred rather than being a direct positive statement. Did they use horses? Absolutely. Certainly towards the later period, I think the vast majority of the army would be on horseback as a standard. But as we read in the Battle of Malden and in other accounts uh, across the Anglo-Saxon world, they would uh, more often than not dismount to fight, to fight in the shield wall so that leaders could inspire the men. They could be the, the armoured heart of the unit that would go and fight against the enemy also in terms of the Germanic honour and all being on a kind of level playing field, which comes through in the poetry quite a lot. And then if needs be, they would get back on horseback. Let's say if the enemy had broken and they needed to chase them down or they needed to be somewhere quickly, they would jump on their horses and then they would ride off. Let me know what you thought about this video in the comments below. Have you got any more evidence about the Anglo-Saxons fighting on horseback? Have I missed something I would honestly love to hear? Because I find this debate really interesting and I've been meaning to make this video for a couple of years and decided, screw it, I'm just going to start making the videos that I want to make. And so here we go with this one. Do let me know in the comments below because I do always love to see what you guys come up with. I have been thinking about potentially making one similar about the Vikings, sort of asking the question, did the Vikings use horses at all? Uh, I'm not actually sure about the answer, which is the kind of video I like to make when I need to really find stuff out as well. There was an awful lot of text in this and quite a bit of reading in Old English. Let me know if that's your kind of thing or if you think, you know what, Hilbert, we get it. You can show the Old English, but didn't bother reading it because honestly, it just drags on forever. Then, you know, let me know that as well. But in the meantime, I have been Hilbert and this has been The History. And don't forget to check out Hunting Clash as well.